Um, so I just have a number of things that I wanted to, Mark, I wanted to talk with you about, and have you engage in dialogue with, and, and, and hopefully the audience will have uh, a variety of things that they might want to, to bring in as well. But I think one thing that might be useful just as a starting point so that I'm not uh, I'm not assuming too much on the part of the uh, of people who have attended is um, is who was Neruda uh, and and how would you uh, explain to us uh, who he was? Sure. Um, so Pablo Neruda was born in 1904 in southern Chile um, on what they called at the time the southern frontier. He called it the Wild West of um, Chile. He moved to Santiago. It's just a very brief um, brief summary of of who he was um, in terms of his life, um, moved to Santiago, um, was named kind of by the radical, by what um, Ray has been working on a lot of the student movement there, which is one of the most radical of South America, comes on the scene and from this provincial outpost, and all of a sudden has been named um, the voice of the student uh, movement of that generation already at the age of 17, 18. Um, a few years later, he goes on at the age of 19 to publish what is still today considered one of the most popular books of Latin American poetry, if not all poetry, The Twenty Love Poems and Song of Despair. Um, then he goes through a little stage of um, wandering, goes to the Far East, he got a diplomat, a lot of Latin American countries, South American countries, especially Chile, would give honorary consul positions um, to artists and poets so that they can go somewhere and do their work. He served in Far East Asia, um, not the very interesting time where he was what he called a period of luminous solitude, um, was very depressed, writing this very fragmented poetry that became part of um, Residencia, um, Residence on Earth, which is also considered one of the most important books of poetry. Um, wasn't so, um, let's say, uh, um, he committed some not so nice acts on the with behavior with the locals there. Um, after that, and just moving quickly, he went to Spain, um, became friends with Garcia Lorca and others. This whole um, just wonderfully um, idealistic and energetic, um, progressive crowd of the Second Spanish Republic, until Lorca was assassinated at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. He starts moving his political his poetry more politically. Um, and that just starts him off on this trajectory to not spend the whole time doing a discourse. But between that and then that clip, um, we're skipping, that was 1936, 1937. And then we get to this clip of that opening clip where you have, um, in 73, and you have, to me what that represents is that here's a poet that means so much for the people of Chile. Um, and people all around the world that for the first time they will come out of the streets and risk being in front of guns and actually not just risk but that those guns were prevented because the world was watching and how this man who had won the Nobel Prize of Literature but was so much more than that could be such a presence and such a fixture and such a symbol for a country and maybe we'll kind of fill in the gaps of that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a couple things uh, um, that, that I think are worth following up, up on, um, which I will in a moment. The, so one of the things that you point out in the book is, uh, is that Neruda has this reputation as being the people's poet. And what's quite interesting is, um, uh, and for those of you who know a little bit about Neruda, I mean, there, there is this sense already at a young age, as you mentioned, that he wins the, the, fet, he wins the, the big competition at the Spring Festival uh, for his poem in 1921 at a very young age, and he's, and he's already then has a celebrated book of uh, collection of poetry published shortly thereafter. But if you could talk a little bit about why he, how, how it is that he becomes this thing known as the people's poet, and what does it mean to be a people's poet, and, and why is it Neruda? Um, first of all, it's not just Neruda. <laughs> I'm sure you're thinking you're saying, but um, and there's a lot of descriptions, and a lot of people say that Neruda, for many reasons, wasn't people's poet the same way. It's a very loose term, um, but there was something about Neruda where he. One of the reasons I call it to begin with, um, one of the reasons I call the book titled the book "The Poet's Calling" is that he kind of felt that this was his duty to be a poet, to express himself 
in ways to the people, to people, to other people, whether it be eventually through political or actually starting when he was 13 in Temuco when he was um, young, he was writing editorials. His uncle happened to have this radical pick newspaper and he was writing an op-ed at the age of 13. Um, and his desire to become, it, it takes a kind of a large art because first of all, his life is just so large, but as you said, you can look at his just being when he was in the student movement and working for Claire Dad, their journal, um, it's very radical journal, anarchist, um, writing le uh, articles after articles and kind of being that voice, but also publishing this book that just kind of exploded and broke open this new language to people. And that's on the love level and not kind of that political, the people's poet. But at the same time, the people's poet is actually getting to those basic raw emotions. And that's one of the things that happened was that he was able to, on the, especially on the political side, synthesize thoughts and emotion in a way um, that distilled them, that made them so simple, but yet so powerful. And caused to kind of evoke change in individuals and light up emotions. And he has actually, when we were going over something before, um, the other thing is that his words followed his actions um, for the most part, because not all of his actions. Um, he, he has um, one of his most famous poems, which actually was a poem that was up there, Heights of Machu Picchu. And it ends um, saying, come to my, he's talking to the Incan, the slaves, the Incan slaves at Machu Picchu, not the Incans themselves, but they're actual slaves, they're workers. And he says, come to my veins and my mouth, speak through my words and my blood. So he's actually assuming the role, this is in, this poem actually really came out in 1950, assuming the role to be the spokesperson himself um, of the people, poet of all the indigenous and all the people of Latin America which is a very presumptuous and somewhat egotistical thing to do, but Neruda was like that, but he does it because of the power of his poetry, but also because he was working on the side. He had just been in exile, that's what the Neruda movie would be about, it's because he was a senator, a poet senator, who was the only one to stand up to the president at that time in 1948, who had basically gone 360 from the supporting the left of oppressing them, um, and he stood up to him so much in, on the Senate floor saying, this is wrong, this is wrong, that he was, um, in order for his arrest for treason was, was sent out, and he had to flee into exile. And all through his life he was doing these, um, whether it's the Spanish Civil War, whether it's his poems when he was 20s, he was working on the political edge that went along with his um, poetry so that it can almost be justified or merited by saying, um, that allow him to say that, or to, to give that some value. Are there, are there things about, um, not, to, not to sort of move into, um, well, maybe to move into areas of interpretation, but are there things about his uh, poetry at earlier points in his life that, that um, like what is it about the poetry that facilitates or, or because there's a lot of resistance from a lot of the establishment at the time. His, his, you know, as you point out, his early poems are not necessarily well reviewed. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of resistance to some of the experimentation uh, and, and the like. Uh, and yet at the same time, the poetry becomes enormously popular, uh, Faith de Bonnes d'Amour in particular. So what is it about the, his, his poetry at a young age and the time period, the context that he's writing in, do you think that that makes it resonate in that way. Um, I think one one thing with just taking the twenty love poems because he wrote he had, that was actually his second book. He was nineteen when he wrote that book. He actually already published another book, um, which had some decent acclaim. Um, but I think first of all he was breaking through a generational gap gap in terms of the critics who were reviewing him. They just thought this was vulgar language. This this. You know, the point of love poems and these quotes that people put up on, no offense to anybody who does here, puts up on Instagram and all the time. Um, and Taylor Swift starts uh, her last two albums ago um, with one of the quotes from these poems. Um, but they, it was just that generation busting through. Julio Cortazar has a great line about how it just, it just, my memory isn't too great right now, but you know, it just opened up a new world. 
And in terms of what is it, when the question is why that time, why his words, it's, I don't think it's a question of why that time. I think, yes, they were revolutionary for that time, but we're still reacting to those words after we've had a hundred years of other words and evolution of writing since then that they still speak to us. Um, speaking of Taylor Swift, uh, so Neruda is, you know, has become a commodity, is an industry. Um, and, uh, and so I'm curious about, first of all, why a new biography of Neruda, there's a lot of biographies of Neruda, we have Neruda's own uh, biography, uh, Confieso que he vivido, um, and there is this kind of uh, industry production around Neruda, he tends to overshadow and eclipse uh, others in certain ways. Um, so, you know, why do biography of Neruda, um, and at the same time, just uh, if you could speak a little bit about how do you navigate the Nerudiania right, uh, of, of things? Um, um, well, as you said, speaking of Taylor Swift, one of the main reasons I wanted to write this was so I could connect and get in contact with Taylor Swift and some backstage passes. And stuff like that for, <laughs> Did that get her? Not yet, but my, my people are talking to her people. So. <laughs> um, but uh, the, um, no, I, I think, I mean, there was, I, so I had started on that movie. We did a rough version of Screen and Neruda Turn Centennial was in 2004, and there was just all this stuff um, going on. NPR the Morning Edition was talking about it. I was in San Francisco where we had a festival, a multidisciplinary festival around him that the Central Neruda that I did with City Lights came out that year. And afterwards, somebody came to me um, and said, you should write a book on, a, a bio, why not a biography on Neruda? And I had to ask him, I sat down and said, but why? You know, does there need to be a new one? And I had read all the other ones um, through various, you know, researching various um, rivers of, of this whole trajectory. Um, but there's none, there, I had several goals that I felt that needed to be met, that, that I could use um, that would enhance a biography or a biography on the Ruta that hadn't been met before. Um, one of the main ones was to be that balance between being hagiographic, not being hagiographic, but not being taking a stance by like, oh, here's something, his Stalinism or what something he did that was wrong and just passing over it. Um, that there's some certain taboos that a lot of books in the Nuriana world won't even touch. Um, and at the same time, I also, there was a, a little thing stylistically in terms of accessibility was that I wanted it to be a real narrative, um, not academic, but not too dry and to read like a novel. And, but mainly I thought um, one thing that had been done in these other books or other works that I felt I had seen as being crucial to understanding Neruda was that there's Neruda's personal life, um, who he is as a person, his relationship with friends, with women and, and, and other people, um, his political life um, and his politics both on and off the page in the poem and what he did off the page which was a lot off the page. Um, and, um, his poetry. Yeah, so I guess I combined those two there. But his, po and that his poetry in general. So his politics, his life, and his poetry. That there's these three grades of Neruda. And that each one kind of needs to be looked at. You can write it. There has been, obviously, books written on each one. Um, but each one depends on the other two. He said, there's a quote, I, I always forget, so I'll read it right. Thank God it's right here. Um, um, if you ask me what my poetry is, I'd have to say, I don't know. But if you ask my poetry, she'll tell me, she'll tell you who I am. And so that each one of these different aspects of his life depends on the other. And if you don't look at all three of them and how they relate to each other, you really can't see the whole Neruda. Um, and that was, there's some other reasons, but yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was the main, that was the main thing, I think. Yeah. Um, one of the things, so you mentioned this, um, a sort of Neruda uh, with, with his um, uh, warts and all, right, as they say, um, you know, and he comes across, 
it, 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 for long passages uh, in the book, you know, it comes across as um, narcissistic, childish, cruel, in places as kind of criminal, um, and misogynistic. Uh, and so one of the things that I think, you know, you try to do, as you mentioned, um, is, is to straddle, right, to avoid the, the gravitational pull of hagiography. And I looked it up, what's the antonym of hagiography, uh, which I never knew, which is homartography, which is probably why everybody just says hatchet job, right? Because <laughs> that's a big mouthful. But so you, you try very hard to navigate between those. And uh, I was wondering if you could say more about that, because there are these places where you know, there's two rape scenes uh, in the book, right? Um, there are, you know, the treatment of his first wife and his first child. Uh, there's, there's some real brutal uh, moments, and yet you have this person who is revered right, by a wider reading public and remembered in a particular kind of way, remembered and treated in a certain kind of way even during his lifetime. And so I was curious if you could talk about that uh, specifically, but also your process of having to figure out <laughs> how to write that. Um, yeah, and as a figure, way of both figuring out, and the more I found out about some of these things that I didn't know about Neruda, kind of digging a little deeper because a lot of these things, these topics, weren't 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 right there on the cover of a lot of these other works. And so, you know, people still today come up to me and ask, "Well, why do you love Neruda so much? How can you love and work so much on on a poet for so long?" And as I kind of mentioned, it, it's gone, kind of gone on steps, gone from steps that have just led me to here. But when I started out in 2004, especially after the centennial, I mean, I was very much into this guy. I knew he had some problems. I had some problems with him. But there was also the self, um, what's the word, the self, you know, coming to terms myself with here's this poet who I've put out there that other political movements have put out there as an iconic figure of justice, and yet here's all this injustice that he's doing. And just coming to that reckoning myself, in terms of writing it, um, and, and also knowing that I'm delivering that to the world, because that's what I wanted to do, I didn't want to filter it. If there is something that I saw, whether it's good or bad, I'm, I'm going to work on it, or, or, or I'm sorry, uh, reveal it just as I would if it was something good or something bad, um, you know, give the criticism in an unflinching way um, and try not to prop up the stuff. And, and it was difficult to navigate at times between putting too much, especially with stuff like the rape, I mean, I can even get into that a little, um, or read, read it, there's, I wouldn't say two rapes, but two possible rape that we know of that Neruda wrote in his own memoir. That have been out, that, that Confesso Que okay, Vito um, came out in 1974, posthumously the year after he was born. And so we have, I can, we'll read, I'll read the passage, mm -hmm. we're good on time, um, that's been out there since the year after I was born. Um, and yet nobody, I'm not saying, not, not nobody, but for the most part, nobody has been talking about Neruda as a rapist until recently. And yeah, somewhat it might be because this. It's right now the, the, of the cultural movement and everything. But why haven't for the past 30 years people been saying that? And that other passage um, where he's in, in France, um, that's from his memoirs. Mm -hmm. um, and so how are they, that's kind of where I was saying at the beginning that not being hagiographic and not being like over here. So you come into the middle and you present it. And I'll read. Um, so this is during the time when um, he was in the Far East. He was lonely, he started using opium. Um, there's also this whole contradiction about him later on saying, going back and talking about the imperialistic um, English, British at the time, when he himself was being very imperialistic or act, taking imperialistic acts on the people um, in his behavior. And um, uh, get this right. So he's in Ceylon, um, and the most beautiful woman Neruda saw in Ceylon was a Tamil of the pariah caste, and quote unquote untouchable, who cleaned out the tin box that was the bottom of his waterless toilet. Quote, and this is from his memoirs. 
She walked solemnly towards the latrine without so much as a side glance at me, not bothering to acknowledge my existence, and vanished with a disgusting receptacle on her head, moving away with the steps of a goddess. She was so lovely, despite her humble job. For him, I write, uh, she was not human, but an exotic other. Um, he goes on to write, like a shy jungle animal, she belonged to another kind of existence, a different world. My own words, she wore a red and gold sari of the cheapest cloth, heavy bangles on her bare ankles, a tiny dot glittered on each side of her nose. He called to her, but it was of no use. That's what he said. Maruta simply couldn't get her off his mind, so, quote, this is his writing, one morning I decided to go all the way. I got a strong grip on her wrist and started into, stared into her eyes. There was no language I could talk with her. She let, she let me lead her without a smile, and she was soon naked on my bed. Her skinny waist, her full hips, the brimming cups of her breasts made her like one of the, the millennial sculptures from southern India. The encounter was of a man with a statue. Her eyes stayed open the whole time, impassable. She was right to despise me. The experience was not repeated. And just to put a little of the commentary of what I said about that, um, is that in his and other writings, um, there's no evidence that Neruda, well, I take this back because actually I just, a friend just showed me a paper and it's actually really interesting. I, I, just to quickly mention to go on that, that he's found other places in his poems where he thinks Neruda is talking about rape um, and kind of a rape mentality or viola violating mentality. Um, and he also, not to take be myself egotistical, he mentioned that um, in, in this paper that this was the first book to call it for what it was of all the biographies to call that scene in the memoirs to call it what it was was a rape and that everybody else just passed it off as something else. Um, and maybe you don't think that's a rape, but um, can I ask like, what the, um, what's been some of the response you've received uh, with the inclusion uh, in the book? Um, there's been a lot of response. Um, I mean, not a lot, I guess, you know, not directed at what me personally having said it and like you shouldn't say that or, you know, but that it's generated this new vision of them um, where people reacting. I, I had, um, a, a reporter, a writer, um, who started off, I, I know she, I first met her because she, um, uh, she interviewed me in 2004 with the celebrations. We were both in San, San Francisco. She wrote, um, interviewed me for the San Francisco Chronicle and my publisher sent something to her or asked her to write something. It was, I don't know if you guys know the website, The Millions, it's kind of a literary website. Um, but anyways, in her review, she basically, the, the gist of it was that um, I love this book. I started off loving Neruda, or I started off loving Neruda. I, I like, I respect Mark. Uh, I like Mark. Um, I was on the subway reading this. Every chapter, I just hated him, hated him more mm -hmm. to the point where he had, she took all, she ends up review taking all, saying that she took off all the Neruda books on her shelf and mm -hmm. it's basically throwing them to be recycled. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, the book, I've been working on this for, you know, it's hard to judge exactly, but for a long time now, and I didn't plan, you know, I had no idea that Neruda as a resistant poet, I'd be coming, I'd be published, I write in here that I'm finishing up the last copy, and it's 100 days into the Trump presidency. So there's this whole question of Neruda, the resistant poet, the most iconic resistance poet, and a lot of that was talking about that of the past century and how is he figuring to Trump. I had no idea, you know, of course, at all about that, the Me Too movement and everything, and, and whether this would have the same resonance. Mm -hmm. um, I would hope it would have um, if this book came out five years ago. Mm -hmm. But that there is that inquiry, and also it's almost been dominating a lot of the discourse um, mm -hmm. and talking about that in almost every review. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, so that, that's interesting that the views were mentioning. Um, I wanted to ask uh, just, just to go in a different direction for a couple of minutes. Um, so there's a lot of figures that show up in the book. Um, you know, you're surrounded by a lot of literary personalities, uh, big personalities of various kinds. Um, but I wanted to pick one in particular uh, 
because this is a person that comes up towards the end of the book as well, and, and this goes back to my question about the Neruda industry also. Um, but just to play devil's advocate a bit for a minute, I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about one of Neruda's great nemesis, uh, nemeses, which is Pablo de Roca. There's a quote, so Pablo de Roca was, a, for those of you who don't know de Roca, uh, he was a contemporary of Neruda's, a little bit older, about 10 years older. Um, but was very experimental in the 19 teens with his poetry, very kind of avant-garde. He ran a newspaper called Newman, which was a kind of workers, intellectuals newspaper. He ran it with a couple of other very prominent radical intellectuals and poets at the time. Uh, and he was a very, um, he was a pretty unyielding individual in some ways, but super experimental in his poetry um, and had very, these very kinds of, um, strict principles that he sent for himself. So, so for example, one of the things that comes across in your book is the root is very adamant about where he's going to get his things published, right? So when he writes uh, Residencia en la Tierra, he's absolutely adamant that it, that it has to be published in Spain first, not someplace else, because otherwise it's going to be ignored, it's going to be marginalized. He has this understanding of the publishing world and how it works, and you know, we still look at that to this day. I mean, if, if, you know, if you have a French publisher and publisher in Paris, it's going to be assigned at Cornell, and if it's published in Santiago, maybe it won't be. Um, so the the interesting thing is, though, is the Roca is adamant that he that he publish his own works, edit his own works, and distribute his own works. He refuses the entire commodity form of publishing in, in and of itself as an industry, uh, and they end up becoming really anti deep antagonists. Even though they're both members of the Communist Party, uh, right? That politically they share an enormous amount, um, but. When you get to the end of the book, it's interesting because you did some interviews with people at a literary fair, and someone said to you, "Enough with Neruda. Why aren't we talking about De Roca? Right? Why aren't we talking about Widobro? Why aren't we talking about Nicanor Quadra? I mean, lots of people are talking about Nicanor Quadra, but anyways, De Roca, not so much. And so, it, what about someone like De Roca? What's getting lost uh, in it, uh, in the gravitational pull of Neruda? And what does someone like De Roca or Widobro?" bring in, if we think about them more, let's say not pushing the root to a side, but, but, but allowing others to occupy that space with him. I'm curious what the, what the world then looks like, poetically and politically. Um, yeah, I mean, the relationship between the two of them, I mean, they weren't just nemesis, they were bitter rivals. It started early. I mm -hmm. mean, back in the 90s, when they were both starting off. And there is a, you know, at first a friendship, there is actually one, um, one time he actually signed, there was, I found um, a, a poem where Neruda signed it to like my friend, the world, you know, um, but then there's just, and not to get into whether it's Neruda who's being petty or, or Naroka who's being totally jealous because they were both being that um, throughout the years and to the point even, I mean, if I talk in the book and a lot of people know about it in Spain where there's this whole war of kind of lit between what a lit a, a, like a literary um guerrilla war um uh between Widobro and Neruda and um and the Roca, where Neruda's um um uh, poem 17 people somebody in Santiago actually who became his great friend and wrote one of the hagiographic biographies the little the title one mm -hmm. discovered that um Neruda basically paraphrased one of Tagore's poems, mm -hmm. um, and that sent off this huge like back and forth from Spain back where, where Widobro and Neruda were back to Chile, and Neruda writes this long poem about you vipers and you snakes and you son of and you whores and you know it's like you know it's like um, and, and and why Rosca and why or why, why Neruda and not Rosca? I think Neruda did see this poet's calling. Um, he named himself, at 16 he changed, I mean to go way back to that before he even met the Rosca or before he even got to Santiago, at, he changed his name you know, basically because he said that he was born uh, naturally Ricardo Eliezer Basolato Reyes, Reyes Basolato, um, but at 16 mainly under the pretenses that his father who was, if I can use it, an asshole, um, and like was throwing his poetry away, and same thing with his older his older brother, who was a singer and never let a guy scholarship to the um, uh, conservatory in Santiago and wouldn't let him go, and, and all this stuff. 
to hide it, hide the poetry from his um, from his parents um, because he was like at fourteen going to these small towns in Chile, in these dusty towns, and wanting to be a poet. And already at fifteen, I mean, we don't. It's just so rare. He would go like a hundred miles and be in a, and get second place in a poetry festival. And the fact that there's poetry festivals in rural Chile in 1920s, and that he would go there, and why he was doing that, and that in a way that by taking the name Pablo Neruda, not only was it some kind of pseudonym to protect his bro him from his father, but in a way it was taking him and naming himself a poet, mm -hmm. um, and kind of saying to that poet's calling, like, I am now a poet, a poet for life, this is my office, um, officio. And he did plan it out. Um, he had a lot of setbacks, you know, uh, there's a time in between 20 love poems and when he was even before he started struggling with the residents on earth where he went through these times, but he still kept going. And then there's the beginning of the modification, even the, lo the love poems, even though they were such a big hit, they really didn't do that much to him. It's not like, I mean, he was still so poor, he had to go to Far East Asia three years afterwards because he, you know, on a consular approach. So, um, it wasn't like it's this bestseller and now all of a sudden he's like, you know, ripped. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh... Working for the console, it was not exactly poverty. No, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's like, it was, it was, I'm sorry, I didn't hear... I was just saying, working for the console, it was not exactly misery. He found it a misery, but economically-wise, um, just the point that you know, um, I mean, when he went, let's just put it, when he went to Spain, that wasn't a misery. When he got the consular position there or Buenos Aires. But just, I'm just saying the fact that it didn't make him rich or anything. He was still struggling. Right. Um, it wasn't until really what really brought him the fame, um, because the residencia didn't do that as well. When Neruda, after Spain, he eventually came to communism, eventually came to Stalinism, which is a whole other topic. But with that Stalinism, with the connection to the Soviet Union, after he actually went out of exile from what we were talking before and into Europe, where he comes and he comes across, um, he crosses over the Andes, and takes a boat, um, and gets to Paris, where it just happens that there's this huge conference um, of partisans for peace, this whole anti-fascist conference with Langston Hughes and up to Pablo Picasso, who says, I have is on stage in front of Five, uh, I forgot how many people, but a huge auditorium in Paris, and says, "I have a surprise for you." And it, and he, and Pablo Neruda comes out off onto the stage, and they give. There's this beautiful picture of the two of them giving a kiss, yeah. and and the whole audience like gets on their feet and and, yeah. um, and applauds. It. And so it was that kind of political aspect after he got to that stage mm -hmm. that didn't happen with the 20 love poems you know mm -hmm. in those years after he was still in you know shitty apartments like mm -hmm. in santiago mm -hmm. and it just went from that in a way and we could talk about this forever but in a way that de Broca never got but, but you're right i mean it wasn't just that there's a couple examples where um there's one i quote in there and then there's one i when i met um the son of uh um a friend they're both he's like 21 very very much revolutionary to the left in Chile. It was like, why are you doing all this stuff on Neruda? Why aren't you doing the Roca? Yeah. And it wasn't just because a lot, there's this whole thing of being post Neruda in Chile, that Chile is kind of post Neruda. But also like, wait, this is a great poet and did a lot of great things politically yeah. that I'm into as like an anarchist trying to start a new uh, constitutional assembly and everything. Why aren't you looking at him? Yeah. Um, or just into him? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. then and then the Neruda, and then it you know continues until Bill Postino and, and everything else. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, Deroca had his finally got his moment as one of the great slam poets, but very very late in in, in life. Um, I mean, I think we should open it up. I just just one last question, and then we're going to open up to everybody. But just in terms of your method, in terms of writing biography and thinking about what it means to be a biographer, especially if someone uh, who's, who's a primary mode of expression is, is poetry. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the, the poetry itself is, uh, it helps or hinders uh, the writing of someone's story, right? So, so for example, you can imagine a variety of biographies in which you have somebody who can read poetry and translate in a particular kind of way, 
and another person who's a biography who's just maybe you know atonal or deaf, right? And can't uh, manage the poetry in the same way. And I can see that comes with both opportunities, but also uh, possible setbacks in a variety of ways. So I'm curious in terms of thinking about having translated uh, uh, Neruda's poetry and published the book with City Lights, um, and uh, you know, it was very well received, it was very interesting translations. How does being a translator of his poetry then impact or shape in some ways how you, how you write a biography of this individual? Yeah, I mean, thanks, that's great question and it's it's kind of come up but not totally in the, in that whole sense where there's writing a biography on it I was just at the National Book Festival had the honor to be there and with Kay Bradfield Jameson I don't know if any of you are familiar with her but she just wrote a book she's a psychiatrist and writes on psychiatry psychiatric types or bipolar especially she just did a biography of Robert Lowell and um, and I'm doing Neruda but her biography was mainly looking at like it was a psychiatric narrative, I think it's as she puts it. So she's reading him from that way, reading his poems. Um, I don't know if I have an answer to this, um, because there's, there's how, how do you look at the poems? How does that, you know, and I think in terms of your question or also me approaching it, how does the poetry inspire what you're writing around it? How does the fact that you're writing, I was talking to Brodsky actually, you know, that, that thing, um, I think it was, but, um, but you know, reading a poem, how does reading a poem in Spanish and reading material in Spanish affect your English, just the creative writing process of it, not just necessarily the reading of it, um, and your interpretations and your following, like almost the poet's calling, how I got that word from, a, primarily from, um, actually the title of one of his poems, um, De Ver del Poeta, which has been translated as Poet's Obligation and Poet's Duty, and then I saw this third layer of it as calling as well, and that there's all these resonances, which I kind of touched on in the book. Um, and um, and I don't know if I would have had that without the language difference. So, um, mm. but it sucked to have to translate so many, like one thing I can say is how much, and you know, I mean, a lot of you guys know this is translating stuff and then having to cut it and just being like, um, <laughs> painful. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to quantify, but yes. but it, it is. I think it is good because it puts you into that different music. I actually had a friend who once said the best thing you can do for a writer forgetting about biography or poetry is to move to a different country and have that other language around you to kind of play off and, and stimulate your own a little. Yeah. Um, and so being absorbed in the Spanish, what he wrote in Spanish, mm -hmm. um, then you have these gringos who are like at I don't know, Cornell writing about the student movement, then you have to read their papers and translate that into better English. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Maybe. Uh, so we'll open it up and I'll let you field the, the questions. Um, well, unless we're whoever. Yeah. So, yeah.